Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm Nora Kane. I'm the director of the Stanford Health Library, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here tonight for the first of our community lectures of 2017. So happy new year to all of you. And it seemed like um, an auspicious way to start the year with some discussions about hair loss and possible regeneration. And uh, it's a great pleasure tonight to introduce uh, Dr. Anthony Oro, who is a professor here at Stanford in the dermatology department. He's also a member of the program in epithelial biology and the Institute for Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine, part of the Children's Health Research Institute and the BioX Institute and the program in cancer biology. His research interests encompass cancer genomics and tumor evolution, stem cell biology, and hair skin development and regeneration, that's where we come in, and definitive molecular and cellular therapeutics. His clinical interests include hair biology, non-melanoma skin cancer, and therapy for genetic skin diseases. So rather than take up much more time, I'm just going to introduce him and welcome him tonight. So let's get on with our first program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nora. <clears throat> Thank you for braving the, um, the, the rain and cold. Um, we're pretty excited to have rain. Um, so um, uh, what I want to do tonight um, is talk to you about hair. Um, uh, it's um, something that's on our mind a lot. Uh, it's dispensable but important. And so but what I hope you'll understand tonight is that uh, it is an organ, and each hair is an organ, which is like all other organs in the body and can, is a window into how we can regenerate other organs like uh, the lung and the liver. Uh, and really, it's, it's, it's a really a model for stem cell biology. Because really, the things we talk about for hair growth are the same things we talk about for trying to regenerate lung and liver, bone, cartilage, and that sort of thing. And so that's what I hope we'll get to um, tonight. And so the title, um, Hair Today Gone Tomorrow, really um, will be um, an important thing. What I want to just point out is that um, our clinic, um, in case you don't know, is the Stanford Hair Clinic. It's over on, on Redwood City uh, in, the, in the Stanford um, Outpatient Medicine Facility. And it's part of uh, a brand new uh, North Campus in Redwood City that Stanford um, uh, really purchased about 30, 35, 36 acres of land right by 101 and Woodside Road. And uh, really is a brand new um, outpatient medical campus there. Um, so I hope they just broke ground. So basically all this is just flat except for our outpatient building and hope you'll visit um, sometime soon. Um, um, what I'd like to do today is, this is sort of the, the schedule that we'd like to talk about today. Um, a little bit about hair biology. What, what is normal hair aging? Um, soil and seed factors, hair color, and then preventing the immune system from ruining your hair and giving you a bad hair day. Um, this is hopefully interactive. And so if you have questions, please raise your hand and, and um, discuss it with me. Um, uh, if not, then we can wait to the end. We'll have a session, a Q and A session at the end. They can answer the questions. All right. So um, what I want to do tonight is to talk to you about. Um, and first to start, it's about hair growth. Um, and um, hair growth really is a matter of seeds and soil. Um, and I think that's the that's really what we want you to think about. Every hair on your head, all thousands of them, um, come out of a group of stem cells that make a hair. So there's basically groups of 10,000s of, of hairs, of little stem cell pockets um, on your scalp that grow a hair out. Um, and that's the hair um, stem cell. And there's, but around that, those stem cells, these guys right here, um, these little stem cells here, around, this is the stem cell, but around the stem cell um, is, uh, are um, a whole microenvironment um, called the soil. Um, it's microenvironment or stem, or stem cell niche, whatever you want to call it. But really, it informs the stem cell when and where to grow. Um, and there's blood vessels and nerves and, and uh, big fat adipocytes, fat cells, that secrete factors that, that cause the hair to grow in response to metabolic um, conditions in your body. Um, and so really, these little buggers are, uh, these the groups of stem cells that make the hair grow are biosensors for the body that um, sense what's going on um, minute to minute, um, and then read that out in terms of how the hair grows. Because these, the hair is just, is just a bunch of protein that's being excreted. And it's a big energy drain on the body to put out 10,000 of these guys at a time. And so 
if, it, if, the thing, if the machine's not working, it, it doesn't want to put it out. And so that's really the issue, is these little biosensors, these stem cells read out the body and then make the hair grow. So it really is like um, little seeds and soil. Okay? Um, and so, the, so this is actually a picture of the, of the soil. Here, like, for example, um, here are the blood vessels and the nerve fibers wrap right around the stem cells. Um, so if you, for example, we'll talk about stress or emotional state. Um, there's little peptides that com are coming from the nerves that actually um, will affect the stem cells. These are big adipocytes. If you have a crash diet, um, the, the factors here that make the hair grow will go away, and then the hair won't grow. And so these are biosensors that make it grow, OK? Um, hair growth is a matter of seed and soil. Um, the seeds are the things that make different types of hair. They encode the instructions. Um, um, on the left there, you can see uh, different kinds of hair, hair color. Um, the seeds are very similar to, like, for example, a peacock, feathers. Each one of the, of the feather stem cells, rather than making a hair, makes feather. Those are also genetically encoded. And actually, um, we can spend a whole evening talking about hair, I mean, about feather biology, which is very similar to hair biology, um, and how birds fly. And why, I mean, they have to fly in a very perfect way. Um, and different animals have different length hair. So for example, um, a mouse, um, it grows very similar to a human hair, but only grows about an inch and a half because the growth cycle, the season I'll talk about, is very short. Um, and like the bunny does the same thing. But there are mutants, um, there are rabbit mutants called um, angora, where well, there's the big ball of fur because the hair doesn't stop growing. Okay? So that's really what we're seeing today is, is going to talk about the seed in the soil. Okay. Oh, welcome. Okay, so um, the basic bottom line for tonight is this. There are different kinds of soil, okay? Here we go. Um, and in different parts of the body, there are different kinds of soil, okay? And the seeds are different as well. So these are um, uh, little green bean seeds, and these are yellow ones. So they make, they're very similar. They make different kinds of hair. These would make different, different qualities of hair. And so if you put these seeds, um, and this is basically how hair development works. Um, this, is, this is developmental biology right here, OK? They basically, what they do is during development, the stem cells are set apart. And um, the, the, skin is, the skin is actually pulled apart. And the stem cells are put into the cell underneath the skin. And they, they start to grow. Okay, but the gen they're encoded and make a different kind. So one kind make this kind of hair, and then they're encoded, the other kind are encoded to make this kind of hair. And so if you look on your, on your scalp, there's terminal hairs, big, thick redwood trees. On your arm, they're, different, they're vellus hairs. They're very tiny ones. So different parts, different soils, different parts of the body have different kinds of hair. It's genetically encoded. Um, and they're required, but how they grow and the quality of where they grow and when they grow is determined by the soil that they're growing in. And what I'm going to uh, I suggest to you tonight that all of the hair biology that you need to know is right here because most of the hair diseases that we're talking about are either problems with the seeds or problems with the quality of the soil. Okay? And we'll talk about more of that tonight. Okay? Is that questions about that? So, so now you know about hair biology, and you can go home because that's all you need to know. Okay. So we know seeds and soil, but what about the seasons? Okay. So there's a again genetically encoded season length of how far the hair grows. So the seeds are encoded and they grow out the hair. But why, for example, does um, a human hair grow and it go down to your waist, whereas a mouse hair is this long? Does it grow faster? No, it grows about the same way, length, uh, rate. But the season of growth is much longer. And so, for example, a human hair grows about that much a month, as you know, but, it, but the season is about four years. And that's why it keeps, keeps growing and growing and growing, and, and then it gets down to your waist. OK? And, that's called the, and then at that point, th there's a cycle um, shown here where um, the hair uh, makes this pops out this hair growth here, and then it basically stops. And and the whole, and the real question that, we're, that biologists are trying to figure out is why does it stop? But it actually knows how to tell time. 
it stops, and then basically he rests and sits there. And the hair stops growing, it's this long, and then basically it ejects the hair, and then another one starts growing for another four years. That's the hair cycle. That happens, and there's a counter with this, the seeds have about 40 growth seasons of their, of, uh, in their, in their uh, DNA. And so if, you're, if it's like three, two to four years, and there's like 40 cycles, it's around 80, and that's your lifetime. Okay, so that's hair biology. It's 40 cycles of about two years on, on average. Um, and, and that's why your hair is this long. Okay, is that clear? Super important. Okay, and this is a, a picture of the old hair that's in a resting phase, that, and then the new um, per, per hair production facility is grown out, and the hair is grown out here, and it's going to basically kick that old one out, and this new one is going to come out this way and then make a new hair out of the same hole. All right? 40 times in your lifetime out of the same hole. Now, what you have to understand about in terms of understanding hair biology and hair disease is this, that each hair on your head is in a different stage of that two-year cycle. Okay? So it's kind of like the freeway. So 100 cars get on the freeway and 100 cars get off. And so it looks like there's the same number of cars on the freeway at the same time. Okay? The flux is the same. Okay? So and on average, um, if I stood here and watched you today and counted all the hairs that came off in the drain, in your comb, as you, you rolled the window down, um, you lose about 100. That's normal. Okay? So 100 hairs is normal. Um, they eject them out, and then their new ones are growing out there at the same time. So that's, and it, the reason why that happens is because the hair then can adapt to different environmental changes, different metabolic changes, different stress changes. And then that allows the body to adapt to different environments because these little biosensors are down there figuring out what's going on in the body, the metabolically and stress and hormonally, and then that's how they're growing. Okay? So that, they're one of the coolest organs in the world. I hope you appreciate this, how this works because it's really cool. Yep? Last question. So if, you know, sometimes your hair gets caught and pulls out. So would it, would it have to wait for whenever that new cell is coming to get out, or would it push it to go out faster? Okay, so that's a good question. So let's say this is your hair, and it gets yanked out. Um, it turns out that if this guy is about ready to go out, start going, it'll then start, it'll actually start the process. Uh, it'll take a little longer, but it's, it'll, it'll regenerate. Yeah, so it's, um, as, long as, you, as long as you don't pull out the, as long as you don't pull out the seeds, um, it'll regrow. They're a little deep. Yeah, so it depends how you yank. Um, so um, that's, that's an important question. But if you, know, if you just pull the hair out, but not the so this is the hair, but the seeds are actually down here. And if you pull this out, then it'll regrow. Okay, is that clear? All right, so we talked about seasons. Um, so season, there's 40, around 40 seasons, and each season is about two years, um, and the flux is variance. And so, okay, so um, as a quiz, what happens um, if um, there's a traffic break um, uh, on the freeway, and then you suddenly release the traffic break? Um, what would you see? How many cars come by? Usually you get 10 a minute. You have a traffic break, they all pile up, and then you release it. How many would come at a time? Start. Exactly, a lot more. Yeah, so you see a lot more coming, coming by, right? Okay, so because of that, if you start to see a lot of hair coming out, there's two reasons, either because it's coming out abnormally or because it got clogged up for a while and then released, and it's all coming out at once. So it's called, it's a transient. Um, but if you, know, if you have a traffic break and then it, um, for a while it piles up, but then it kind of evens out and goes back to where it was, okay? Is that clear? There's, that's a huge thing, because a lot of the disease I'll talk about later on is, um, is an apparent hair loss um, called telogen effluvium, that's their name, but it's, it's really because they all piled up at once and it all came out, okay? So that, that's one thing you have to think about, all right? Good answer. Okay, if you understand the seasons, then this is a great cartoon where there's a guy with the horns on his head, and the you know, horns actually are like hair, they actually fall off during the seasons. 
and the, and the doctor says, well, before trying surgery, I'd like to wait and see if you just shed them in the spring. So a lot of things that, that actually are abnormal, if, if, the, if, you, if the thing is constantly turning over, will actually, it'll fix itself if you just wait long enough for the next season, okay? And that's part of what we have to think about with hair disorders because that's an important thing. Okay, texture. Um, the composition of the hair, the little protein tube that comes out, which is a hair, the hair keratins, is genetically encoded. And you know that because of animals like, like uh, sheep. These are inbred lines of sheep that have very um, specific kinds of proteins in their wool that give them the quality of the hair keratin, the wool keratin, which is just like the hair keratin, um, that gives them the properties for the sweaters and coats that, they, that you make. For example, very famous merino wool um, has, is curly. So what it does is it, it, it really curls up. So when you pack it together, it's curly, so it actually provides a lot of air and it's a, a lot of uh, breathing. Whereas Dorper hybrid wool is actually flat, and so when you make a, a sweater of this, it's very dense and warm. That was specifically encoded by these sheep um, farmers. Um, the types of hair protein keratins that are made determine the quality of the hair um, and the, the kinkiness, okay? Uh, also, the length and the duration is also encoded. So they actually can breed um, these animals to, for exactly the length of the season, of the length of the hair, the quality of the hair, the color, um, to make um, products, okay? Now, what happens um, when we get older? Okay, so this is an important question. And so um, there's something called, there's a warranty for these seeds, okay? So um, there's, different, there's just different seasons, and some of, these season, some of these seeds can grow for 40 seasons. Some of them can grow for 20 seasons. Some of them can grow for five seasons. And so the, these warranties, if you will, are genetically encoded in your hair seeds. And so at birth, the, they're given a warranty, and so... Um, then after, so for example, if your warranty is for five cycles and each cycle is about two to four years, then about 18 or so, you'll start to lose the growth cycle and the hair will start to sh sh go, get smaller and miniaturized and then go away. Okay? So on average, this is what you see with age, in 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. You start to start some of the seeds um, which have smaller, shorter warranties have started to, to then sort of peter out. And then the, your hair starts to thin. Um, and that's, this is normal hair biology, okay? It's just, it's basically like, it's, it's basic farming. After a while, the seeds give out, okay? And this is what a uh, scanning electron microscope of a normal, of a hair shaft at age 20 and age 60, okay? So it's thinner. Um, it's lost this outer covering called the cuticle, which keeps all the moisture in um, and um, actually takes up a lot of the color. You're also going to see that the, the machinery that's making the hair, the stem cells, are, are making some, having some errors, so there's breaks and cuts. Um, and also, um, uh, it's, it's not made, so it's more brittle. Okay? That's basically normal hair biology. Okay? Um, so... That results in loss of moisture because the cuticle, which keeps the water in the hair, goes away, which is more brittle, loss of hair strength, fraying of the ends, and a shorter hair length. That's, that's, what we, that's a normal biology. Okay? Um, so the seed warranty is genetically encoded. So sometimes 18-year-olds can have male pattern baldness, which really is uh, a shortened seed warranty, if you will. Also centenarians... Um, even though they're both wondering about it, um, plenty of hair. Um, and so it's really a genetically encoded question. And, and so the real question, which we'll talk about, is how do you uh, adjust that warranty? How do, you give it, how do you buy an extended warranty plan for your seeds? Okay? Yeah. Are these uh, related to telomeres? Um, uh, indirectly, they are. And the telomeres um, keep them going. And the rate of shortening is important. The question is, what are the, the, the molecules that actually regulate the telomeres? Yep. Yeah, in the back. Um, is it true that women inherit their genes from 
mother's side or here? So the question is, um, is it, do the mothers uh, do you inherit the balding from uh, from your mother? Yeah. Um, yeah. So we'll talk about a little. My father bald, was bald. Yes. But my mother has a lot of hair. Yeah. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that, but it's 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 really it's complicated genetics. It's not simple, um, and so you, you have two parents that are have lots of hair and you don't have any, <laughs> and vice versa. So you, so bottom line is you can't blame your parents. I mean you can, but. Not for this. I heard the, the baldness, uh, baldness is a skip the generation. Is that a myth or true? So does baldness yes. skip generations? Um, uh, in some types of genetics, they, it does. But it's, it's a complicated, it's not a simple, yeah, yeah. So it can happen. It can. The father has a thinning hair. Yep. The son can also have a thin. Uh -huh. It can happen. It can happen, yeah. You had a question? Oh, the same question. Okay. Uh, someone whose hair turns white when they're 20, does this tell us anything about the aging process? Yeah, so um, save that question until a little bit later. I have a whole section on that. Okay. Um, all right. So um, let's talk about how to slow basic things, practical things on how to slow the normal aging process. Okay, so I just showed you this is what your hair looks like um, when, when, as you get older. Okay, so the key really is to replace this outer covering um, because that's the thing that keeps the moisture in and it protects the hair from breaking, this, little, this tube of protein from breaking off. Um, and so, um, so how do you do that? So really, you have to replace it and protect that outer covering. And now, um, if you, the, the um, cosmetic companies and shampoo companies are really becoming much more sophisticated about the quality of the conditioners that they use. And they don't just straighten or, or uh, you know, replace, but they have um, uh, lipids in mo most conditioners, higher end conditioners, that actually form a, a layer around the hair that, that actually will replace that covering. Okay? Um, but also, because that outer um, cuticle coat is, there, is now um, gone, sunlight can actually um, hit the, the, the hair and then cause damage to it much, much more easily. And so sun protection, you don't think about protecting your hair from the sun, but um, it becomes more brittle and more sensitive to sunlight. And so sun protection is even more important now that, um, to protect the hair from breaking. Um, avoiding harsh shampoos um, or repeated um, or high uh, blowing dry on a, on a high, setting, high heat setting, because the high heat will actually, because it's brittle, will break it off. Um, and just a little more careful with coloring agents because when you're a little younger, the coloring agents, you can just d do it once a month. But um, the color, um, it take, is taken because the cuticle takes up most of the color, the color you need to use may, may change as you get older because it doesn't give you the same color with the same agents. Um, and the harsh chemicals are much, much, are much more likely to break the hair. So you gotta talk to your stylist to say, okay, we gotta, like, as you get older, you gotta change and adapt a little bit. Bless you. Um, also, stress and inflammation can accelerate this aging process. Um, and we can talk a little bit about the evidence for stress reduction and diet in terms of um, reducing the aging process, but it can actually rapidly age and actually subtract and detract from the warranty of some of these seeds um, a little bit faster. Uh, the hair shampoo or conditioner. There is a, you know, if you look at the ingredient, the, the expensive one to the cheaper one, there are so many chemicals in there. Yeah. One of the things you have to avoid, is that true? Uh, sulfur, what is it? Something to do with, I, I, right now, I, is it something to do with sulfur? Lower sulfur, yeah. Yeah, lower yep. sulfur. Yep. Is that really bad? Um, I just hear that can cause losing hair. So this, uh, the soap called sulfur lower sulfate, is, yeah. is it? It's just, that's one of the harsher um, soaps. But most of chemical, I mean, I look at the expensive, right. the low, uh, low, I mean, a lower, that is all like a second or third. Yeah, ingredient. but you'll see, you, what you'll see coming out is, is now shampoos and conditioners for, um, for the older population, which have less of those harsh chemicals and more things to wrap around. So you'll see those coming out in the future. What do you, was do you recommend some? Excuse me? What was the chemical? It's sodium lauryl sulfate. Sodium. S, yeah, it's sodium lauryl sulfate. It's a, it's a very... Common soap. Is that making you uh, soapy? Is that the one? It's a soapy, yeah. And uh, 
at the end of the lecture, can you recommend some better condi better hair product? Do if you, you if you still have a question at the end, then we'll talk. Okay. okay? Yeah, in the back. What about ladies who color their hair versus not color? Is there is there a difference like ladies who who just like, um, yeah, so the answer is no. I mean, the answer is the, the protein tube is dead. So it's not going to affect the, the stem cells itself. So coloring your hair per se does not make a difference. Um, also, it makes you happier, and so go for it. Um, uh, so there's a, you know, there's a psychological advantage, which actually helps the stem cells as well. But So that's one thing. But as long as it's not a harsh chemical that then will cause an allergic reaction or breakage of the hair, it's, it's perfectly fine. Okay? Question about uh, what you mentioned earlier on soil. Um, uh -huh. What about maintaining or encouraging the, the sort of the health of the soil? For example, my dad was saying, you know, he likes to use these um, plastic scrubbers and has had to really massage yeah. in the shower. Is that would that make a difference? Or so the question is on um, plastic scrubbers or massa massaging your scalp. Yeah. Um, so we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, maybe I'll go on for now, and then if you have, um, uh, okay, so. Let's talk about more specifics about how your hair grows. And we're talking about more about seeds and soil, seasons of the growth, and the seed warranty. Um, OK, first, um, soil factors. OK? So um, the, if you go to the store, this stuff is super expensive soil. OK, this is like at, from Home Depot. It's the top of the line. It has potassium. It's got everything a plant and a seed ever need to grow. Um, it's specific for the roses, and so it's really, it's tuned for it, okay? Um, similarly, your, um, the hair follicle stem cells um, have a, um, this environment here around the cells um, is, there's a certain uh, critical things. So common questions we get in the hair clinic are, do nutritional supplements help? Um, what hormones help or hurt? What about stress? And what about the medicines I'm taking? Because sometimes I think that that I'm on 20 medicines and my hair stops growing. What do I do? Okay, let's talk briefly about, this, is a, this could be an entire lecture in itself. <laughs> every, actually, every one of the next four slides can be an entire lecture. Um, but the most important one to think about is that there's, ro there's a lot of um, epi phenomenon that people talk about, and then there's things that people, that I, I would feel like I, I feel confident in saying, and it's been well documented. Um, these four, of uh, these three in particular, iron, biotin, and zinc, are really critical for hair, for normal hair growth, especially iron. Um, and, um, but what you need is enough, um, and more is not better. So you just need enough that, um, th that the factory can actually grow um, the hairs, um, because it uses iron, zinc, and biotin to actually grow it. Um, and heavy metals from drinking water in particular can inhibit hair growth. Um, and so, um, these are some things we check, or we can check, um, um, in the blood, um, and so we just make sure that that's going, off, that's going okay. But I will mention that um, you can get this, this kind of these, a daily requirement for normal hair growth with a normal daily diet, um, well balanced with, with, you know, veg, with leafy greens. And so you don't need to, like, there are um, plenty of supplements out there on the market called hair supplements that have um, extraordinary amounts of biotin um, and zinc in them. And um, they don't hurt you, you just, you just pee them out, um, the stuff you don't need. But as, if you have a normal diet, usually you get enough. Of these. these are just cofactors for enzymes that work in the hair. Okay? What about um, sex, stress, and metabolic hormones? Okay, these are key. Because um, one of the things we know about um, particular male pattern baldness is that um, too much male hormone, and particularly this one called DHT, dihydrotestosterone accelerates um, the aging process and um, reduces the warranty on the seeds so that um, they start to shrink, become miniaturized much earlier. In contrast, female hormone slows it down. Um, we know that vitamin D plays a critical role in allowing hair to grow, and so you need enough vitamin D for it to work. Um, thyroid hormone is absolutely critical for hair growth because it's the signal that the, the hair follicle stem cells sense to get uh, as a metabolic signal for the body. And stress hormone basically arrests hair growth. And so more stress, less hair growth. It's, I think the hair says, wow, this is a really stressful place. Um, I don't want to put the energy out to make the hair grow. 
Um, and as I mentioned before, the peripheral nervous system interacts directly with the hair, um, uh, or it wraps, actually wraps around the seeds, the stem cells. And so when, when you're, whatever stress is coming through your, the peripheral nervous system, the little peptides from the nerve actually will write on the hair stem cells. And so um, we have people in our clinic that um, they get, um, th when they stress, they start to shed dramatically, and then they stop. Other people don't do that, but many people do that. Um, I, I can tell how um, stressful a person's job is in, with some people by how much they're, they're, they're just dumping hair. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is, a, this is an individual thing. It doesn't happen to everybody, but, um, it's, but there is a very st strict correlation. Um, and stress will put the hair into a quiescent resting phase. Okay, what about the medicines I'm taking? Often, um, as, you get, as we age, we, get, we take more medicines, and associated with aging, we also get um, medicine, take more medicines and have more hair loss. And so it's often confusing which is what is causing it. Um, what we know is that particular medicines um, do have a role in, in reducing the rate of hair growth or putting the little seeds and slowing them down. And then in particular, antidepressants like um, Zoloft, Prozac, and Paxil, blood pressure medicines like beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, um, anticoagulants like warfarin and anti-gout medicine like Walperin are also very well known to cause a dramatic um, hair slowing and loss. So um, the hard part is to try to switch out there to figure out which one is gonna do it or not. And so um, we often in the hair clinic work together with um, your primary care doctor to try to figure out and then swap them out just to figure out which one will work. Okay, male and female pattern baldness. So this is a big question that people have. Um, what's the difference between um, normal aging, where the hair season, the, the season of the hair gets smaller, the, the miniaturizes and the hair gets smaller, versus patterned alopecia? Um, because in a sense, they're, they're quite similar, except that patterned alopecia is patterned, whereas aging is a general process all over your scalp. Okay, so why, um, why do men, when they bald, in male pattern baldness look like this? So they, this is the sort of stages of male pattern baldness, and women do it a different way. Is it a different process, or is it just a different pattern? We can have a vote, but um, I'll just tell you that um, it's pretty much the same pattern. And it gets back to this analogy here, that every, every part of the real estate of your scalp is actually, there's a GPS that's encoded in, in the DNA. That, um, so every part of the scalp has a different set of stem cells and is encoded differently. And so in, in a man um, who has susceptibility to male pattern baldness, this part of the scalp, the warranty of these seeds is different than the warranty of these seeds. And that's genetically encoded because there is really like a GPS that says, okay, you go two centimeters back and to the left and this is, you know, that's, that, and there's, that's actually, those are encoded. Um, and over here, these are different than this. And so that's just, the, there's developmentally how it works. And so women, but, um, but both of them are sensitive to male hormone. Both of them um, are, uh, you know, uh, more female hormone makes it um, uh, long, last longer. Um, and the difference between male and female pattern baldness and, and aging is that this comes on earlier. Um, the onset for um, androgenic alopecia is um, earlier, and usually aging is after 60. The distribution is patterned versus more diffuse. They're both follicular downsizing the shorter hairs, they're smaller, more brittle. Um, this one's sensitive, much more sensitive to male hormone and actually other things which we'll talk about. Where well, this is actually not hormonally mediated, it's just the seeds are giving out, their warranty is done. Um, as we mentioned before, this is the male pattern baldness is polygenic. It doesn't necessarily come from your mother or father. It's, it's, um, there's a whole set of um, these genome-wide association studies with male pattern balding and it's clear it's 20, 30, 40 genes working together. So it's really a complicated mix. I mean, you can't, I mean it, it's possible you can get it passed along, but it's really, and there, there are some families where it's very strong. I mean, you can tell that that, that person's an O'Brien because 
every single person in their family is the same way. But that's, that's just genetics. Um, and the aging process is really unclear. And this is really what we're trying to figure out. We're using male pattern baldness as a proxy for aging. So it's, it's really giving us a lot of insight into aging. OK. So factors known, to, as I mentioned before, to accelerate um, androgenic hair loss, male, male hormone, dihydrotestosterone, testosterone, reduced female hormone, reduced blood flow to the hair follicle, um, stress and inflammation. So um, it's really clear that stress and inflammation make the aging process more rapid. Um, and I can talk, this is a whole lecture in itself. I can talk more about that. But um, the, the mechanism for how inflammation and stress, which induces inflammation, um, ages the, the um, stem cells is, um, uh, is, is very clear. Yes? Uh, minoxidil is usually used to actually encourage the hair growth. So I don't know how it fits up to that category. Yeah, so these are the, um, some of the drugs we could use right. to actually um, uh, counteract um, some of these processes. So for example, um, uh, Propecia is, call, is called finasteride. Um, and, and then it's, um, uh, there's another uh, Propecia-like medicine called Dastra. Oh, I see. Okay, I get it. Yeah. And they're treatments. And they're treatments, oh, right. Okay. They'll, which block? I don't, I don't understand. For reducing male, you can actually do estrogen replacement. Right. Um, for increasing blood flow, minoxidil. Um, Laser Max Comb, which I don't know if you've seen those, which is, uh, it's basically, um, it's, a, it's a red light laser that you just comb through your hair. Um, and it's, um, it does increase the hair a little bit, about as much as minoxidil. But um, I think what it does is it just increases blood flow to the scalp. Um, but, um, and then this, there's these thing called hair helmets, which I don't know if you've seen those or not. But they cost a few thousand dollars, or a few hundred dollars at least, and you put them on your head at night, um, and it shines re uh, red light on your scalp. I think the same is it's increasing the blood flow. Um, it's not really clear how it works. But these are some of the, the ideas for um, male pattern baldness um, and female pattern baldness as well. Yeah? Um, doesn't that cause facial hair growth for women? So um, good, good point. Um, so a lot of these things, um, uh, if you're trying to uh, um, reduce or, or um, uh, sometimes when you block the male hormone um, in different places, you get more facial hair, for example. And in, in women, that's the case. So it can, if used in the wrong way and the wrong concentration, um, bring out some facial hair in women, um, which is an issue. So you have to be really careful how you use it. They wouldn't. Yeah. Right. OK, and then finally, hair transplantation is also um, really the definitive. Um, it's the original um, hair um, stem cell transplant procedure, because what you do is you, um, you're basically taking um, seeds that have a long warranty, taking them out, and then transferring them to the same seed with its long warranty into, into a position where the seeds used to have a, a short warranty, but, but the seeds bring their long warranty with them. Okay? The procedure doesn't create um, any new stem cells. It just redistributes the ones you have to that have longer, longer warranties um, to, to um, spread out over a, a greater area, OK? Um, but it works, and it works because now you know how it works, because the seeds that, you're, that are over here that have a longer warranty are, are put into the, a place where the short warranty, and they just keep growing. Yeah, um, maybe the question and answer. Yeah, yeah I will. Um, um, the question is about um, hair transplantation and um, more specifics about it. Why don't we talk about that in the um, Q&A period, if we get through that? Because um, um, the question is, uh, there's, 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 it, it's a lot more. There's like three different kinds of, of hair transplantation um, techniques um, that we can talk about, if, if you like. Um, there's a robotic one. There's a Flick your unit transplantation um, that are, um, that's more of um, uh, specific topics, but we can talk about that in the, the Q&A if you'd like. Okay, getting back to a previous question then, what about hair pigmentation? Questions like, why am I going gray? 
Um, and the big one is my friend went gray overnight. Um, and so, and also, I took a drug. I had, I had cancer. I took this, this chemotherapy. Um, and suddenly, every hair in my body went gray. Why is that? Okay. So after this, hopefully you'll understand. So what happens is that hair color comes from a set of cells that are next to the seed that makes the hair, the melanocytes. And that melanocyte has to basically come down with the stem cells and then inject hair, in, inject pigment into the hair. So it's a, it's a separate set of cells called melanocytes up here that basically sit right in the hair follicle stem cells and then inject the pigment in as, it, as the hair grows out. So basically the hair is growing like this and the melanocytes putting, hair, putting pigment into the hair as it grows out. The hair color is determined genetically by how much melanin the melanocyte makes and the kind of melanin it makes. So basically, it concocts this, this pigment packet and the, in, in the melanocyte and then basically transfers it from one cell to the other as the, as the hair is growing out. And it goes, okay, brown, 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 and it makes sure it's the same color. Okay? Um, it's pretty amazing. Um, stress hormones, drugs can alter the pigment and the color of the hair. Um, and also, um, you know, dyes and bleaches can do the same. Um, um, but the issue here is the 50-50-50 rule, which is that in general, so if those little cells, the melanocytes, die off, they have a warranty as well. Um, and if they die off, then your hair goes gray because the hair can be produced, but there's no pigment packets to go into the hair as the hair is coming out. Okay? So... The loss of melanocytes due to aging or inability of melanocytes to make pigment, which is called um, al albinism or albinoism, albinos, or chemotherapy, results in, um, in the hair being unpigmented or gray. All right? So the 50-50-50 rule is that in general, 50% of uh, your hair is gray and 50% of people by age 50. Okay? So that's in general um, in, in the U.S., Right? So if, if you line up 50 people who are 50 and then check their hair, in general, though, about 50% of them will have gray hair. About 50% of their head will be gray. Um, so that is 50%, um, not like every hair will be half gray, 50%, but 50% will, will be all gray and 50% will still have pigment because 50% of their, of their melanocytes are still around doing, doing their business. Okay. Yeah, so what the question is how to keep those little, those little melanocytes around longer so that they don't die off and so you don't get gray. And so sun protection, again, we, dermatologists, I'm a dermatologist, it's always about sun protection. Well, here's another reason why to protect yourself because the sun damage um, will actually speed up and, and inflammation and stress um, speed up the, the death of these little cells and make you gray faster. Um, heart, some people believe harsh chemicals, peroxides, and chemicals, um, uh, and this is where there's a lot of debate. Um, um, getting back to your question in the back about, about does, if you dye your hair a lot, does that make, well, you dye your hair because you're going, because the color is not the right color. Um, sometimes harsh chemicals can actually hurt the melanocytes that make the pigment, and so they goes away faster, um, but it's a vicious cycle. Um, and we know inflammation is known to increase graying. Um, just look at President Obama <laughs> um, um, and stress. Okay. And then the last thing I just want to touch on is um, how the immune system and trying to prevent the immunity and inflammation from um, interfering with your hair. Um, because a question we often get is, when I'm stressed, I get little patches of hair loss that, that are there for a while, and then they go away. And so um, what I wanted to point out, again, is this slide here where this is the, the former hair from one season. This is the new hair shaft growing out, and it's going to grow out the same place, kick that hair out, and then grow out the same hole. But one of the things you notice in this, this, this picture is that there's no immune cells. So... This thing is growing down there, like deep into your scalp. There's not, and not, the immune system doesn't care. It's like, be my guest, okay? 
So it's, it's basically like, it's like it's wearing Harry Potter's invisibility cloak, okay? And it, the, the immune system can't see it, um, which is the reason why it can keep growing down and be happy and grow for two years and, and still grow, okay? However, sometimes there are these hiccups when the immune system goes, wow, there's a hair, there's a, something growing down into your scalp. What's, what is that? And it starts to attack it. And you get um, a disease called alopecia areata, um, which is super common. About 2% of the population um, have little, these little circles of, of hair loss. Um, and, um, or you can get bigger ones called, this is the ophiasis distribution, where it's all the way around. Or totalis, where every hair on your scalp is gone. Or universalis, which is every hair all over your body. Um, and we see this very commonly in our clinic. Um, so this person has eye, eyelash, eyebrows and eyelashes, but often you lose those two. And that's if your immune system really is going after every hair, okay? But what it's doing, and this is what it looks like, it's where the immune system is basically in, in the middle of the hair disrupting its growth. Okay? But what the key is that it, the immune cells are influencing the growth, but the seeds are still present. Because this is the more mature hair, but the seeds up here are actually still protected. So what it's doing is it's putting the hair, the immune system then is putting its hair into, uh, into a sleep, into quiescence. And we've discovered this um, uh, both through genetics and through um, hair biology, that the stem cells are there just waiting to grow, but the immune system is preventing it. So if you can actually just block the immune system in the right way, it'll allow the, the stem cells to then grow back out. And in fact, if you pick the right drug, and there's a new rheumatologic drug called tofacitinib or gel, gelzans is the trade name, um, it blocks the immune system. And people who were completely bald, even up to 22 years, um, now have a full head of hair. Wow. And so this really shows, if you understand the biology and the power of how to treat the stem cells um, and wake them up, um, you can actually get pretty amazing results. Um, uh, with, with, with treatment. And so the idea here is to try that this with male pattern baldness is to use stem cell drugs to um, wake up the stem cells. Um, they, they're starting to age, maybe re, um, re-lengthen their telomeres um, and, and then sort of uh, recondition them so that then they can go on and have a long growing season and a longer warranty. Okay, So that's really where um, a lot of the, the, the research is going right now is drugs that do that. Okay, so um, it's 7.48. So I just wanted to summarize what I told you, that hair biology really is a matter of seeds and soil. I talked to you about normal hair aging and how to prevent the aging. There are soil factors, um, nutritional, stress, hormonal environments. There are seed factors which are genetically encoded, which you try to modify with drugs. We talked about the melanocyte that injects pigment and why you get gray. And Things that, um, both that, things that can help with immune interference, um, even on a small level, might help grow, hit the hair to grow better. Um, and that includes, we can talk about diet, stress, and also um, autoimmunity. Um, and then just to remind you about the Stanford Hair Clinic um, in Redwood City if you have any questions about hair or biology. So I'll stop and I'll take any questions. Yeah. Yeah. And then when it came back in, it was very curly. Why does that happen? So the question is, um, post-chemotherapy, the hair quality changes. Okay. So um, uh, if you were, if you understood the lecture, um, I'll just tell you that um, what chemotherapy does is it damages the instructions in the seed. Okay. And so um, if that's the case, then... Um, your, your, oops, your hair used to be this, and then it got changed to this because the instructions got damaged by chemotherapy. Okay? So that's, that's kind of how it works. Yeah? Have you develop certain drugs, like it's a pretty dramatic picture and the other thing, and now you're causing something to grow that hasn't stopped growing. How specific is it just for the hair, or would it cause other things to grow in the body? Yeah. Um, so the question is, um, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, um, 
the drugs that are f for this particular um, um, anti-inflammatory drug, does it have specific effects on the hair or does it have effects other places as well? It's a pill and so it, it basically affects this, this infl inflammatory signal all over the body. And so um, I'll just tell you, every drug has side effects and the question is what's the risk, what's the benefit risk ratio? Um, and so with this particular drug, we're using a low dose and so it, the, that ratio is pretty good. Um, but that's a personal decision about um, how it works. Yeah. Is there something I'm going to use? I can't remember the exact. Just something about a something head with a plasma that you can inject uh, under the skin that yep. stimulate. Can you comment on that? Yeah. So the question is about um, a, a treatment called um, platelet-rich plasma, or PRP. Um, and so this is, um, you'll, you'll I, I guarantee you'll see this. Um, uh, so some people are, what you do is you take the blood out and you spin down the cells in your blood. There's the platelets, the ones that hold, that, like, hold that, that form a clot after you cut yourself. And there's, um, so in the sports literature, after an injury to a, the, like a baseball player's hip, um, they, they use this PRP and inject it into the joint and it actually it helps them heal much faster. And that's actually pretty well known. What it does, it, it blocks inflammation, allows the healing process to occur. So there are some people that believe that doing this for hair growth and injecting the scalp will actually cause hair to grow. Um, and that, that's still, um, and so I think what I saw in the news was, uh, well, on uh, advertisement, you pay one fee, seven injections um, uh, in your scalp and that they'll, that's when you get hair growth. And so um, the data, is, I'll just tell you that the data is very um, sketchy about the benefit of that yet. Um, and um, I'm not sure how the mechanism works because there's not much inflammation as I showed you in the, um, um, in the male pattern baldness. For alopecia areata, it might work. I, mean, I, can, I can see how that would work. But for, for male and female pattern baldness, I'm not sure how that would work. Well, I don't even know how it would work. Would work. Yeah. You mentioned one of the sort of solution for increasing a blood flow to have follicles. You mentioned laser comb and yeah. hair. Are these um, instruments safe? I mean, so the question is about um, uh, there are there are devices that you put on your scalp to increase blood flow. Um, Laser Max, there's, there's called hair helmets. Um, Google it, I guarantee you, it's a good, uh, you'll get a good laugh at the, the designs. It looks like you're orbiting the earth. Um, um, uh, they're safe, I mean, they're, they're FDA approved. So, the, and the FDA approves them because they're safe. So they're safe. But um, the question is, are they worth the money that they spent, that you spent, I think the, the jury's still out there. Sir? I'm confused with you terminology of using the word stem cell for the production or for the seed yeah. and how that is connected with the general usage of the term stem cell. These are not really stem cells, are they, in the sense of a cell that can become any kind of cell any, in the body? Yeah. In the body? Yeah. So good question. Um, the question is the use of the term stem cell and how that relates to the word I was saying with seeds. So the word stem cell means um, is, a, is a cell that has the capability of making other t cell types. Um, and the ultimate stem cell is um, the oocyte, the, the mother's egg, when it's fertilized. And that fertilized egg has the ability to make every cell in the body. So we have, there's human embryonic stem cells, actually our lab works on some of those as well, uh, that can make every tissue in the body. It has the capability of making it. These um, hair stem cells uh, would be called somatic stem cells because they, have a, they, they make other tissues, but they have a limited repertoire. They're, like, they're more limited than the oocytes, the egg, which can make every cell, every tissue in the body. These hair follicle stem cells, they're, they can make uh, different types of hair, different layers of hair. They can make, actually they can contribute to making this kind of hair, the skin as well, under certain conditions. So they have the capability of, of actually, re, when you actually, um, you know, cut, uh, if you cut yourself, notice how on your scalp, 
you, it heals much faster because the, the hair follicle stem cells can actually contribute to wound healing as well. So they, they're stem cells in a true sense of the word, um, but they're somatic stem cells because they have a limited repertoire compared to other ones. So the muscle stem cells can't make hair, and the hair stem cells can't make muscle, but they can make many different tissues within each organ. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, could you compare minoxidil and finasteride? You know, as to which is better? Yeah. So the question is comparing um, drugs which block dihydrotestosterone and drugs which increase blood flow, like minoxidil. And um, I would so one's a topical, one's an oral. That's right now. Um, there, there's move to make a topical um, finasteride, um, but that's not ready yet. Um, so um, I would say. Uh, they, so first of all, um, generally the, the oral medicine is stronger, but has, can have side effects. The topical, um, has, um, is safer in some ways, but it can cause scalp irritation from the vehicle that it's in. And also it's kind of a hassle because people don't, you know, it's not exactly a great hair product because it's, you know, it's a solution so it match your hair down. So people don't want to use it every day, whereas a pill is pretty straightforward. So that's, so um, the side effects of finasteride, um, so we use, for men we give it as one milligram tablets, and um, uh, the five milligram dose is um, basically the castration dose. <laughs> and we give it at one milligram, okay? And so 99% of people, of men, um, have no problem with it, okay? So there's this window where actually you can block the hair, you can let your hair grow, but the rest of your body's fine. Um, but there are that, that 1% that have side effects, and they're the obvious side effects of the, the male, maleness side effects. Um, and there's also evidence that it affects um, you know, the brain configuration um, uh, of maleness too. And so um, there's a whole, now there's a post finasteride syndrome uh, where it, after you stop it, it doesn't reverse um, in that 1% of people. And so um, that is a true side effect. And that's, um, people need to be aware of that. Um, and it's, you know, you see it in the National Enquirer and you laugh, but there, it is a real, but it's in, one, it's in that small percentage of people, very small percentage of people. Most of the people in a clinic, um, so what we do is we monitor very carefully the initial few months to see how you're doing. Um, and, if, and make sure that you don't have, you're not the 1% that have side effects. And then generally it's very well tolerated after that. Yep. The stem cell medicines that are, you mentioned are currently being researched now, how far, any guess on, are we talking a few years, 10 years, 20 years, how far away are we? Um, because of the, things like the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, that the, the bond that you guys, that the California public funded for stem cell research, there's a huge amount of research in, in, stem, in all sorts of stem cells, somatic stem cells. And it turns out that um, medicines or, or um, uh, drugs that affect stem cells in the heart and brain and lung, they all have very similar effects on the hair follicle as well. And so some of those are being tested right now um, for their effects. And so not just potentially, but actually really trying a different, in very clinically relevant scenarios to um, see if they work. Um, they work in animal models, but the question is, so will they work um, on you and I? And that's, that's, that's the big, so that's, it's not 10 or 20 years, it's very soon. Um, the testing, the question is, will they work or not? Um, 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 there is another, uh, uh, there's a prostaglandin-like molecule, which is one of those other ones, these stem cell molecules, and that one's being tested um, now, like in the phase one, two clinical trials, so that will, that'll, that will read out in a, you know probably the end of the year. So that so it's not you know it's not long. It's it's happening now. Hi, yeah, in the back. Yeah, do you have any current clinical trials going on for hair growth? Um, good question. So the question is about our clinical trials at Stanford. Um, so um, our uh, we have a young, uh, uh, very dynamic. Uh, hair group at Stanford in our clinic. Um, um, we have a lot of data on and uh, trials on the autoimmune form of um, hair, alopecia areata. Um, we've just, you know, uh, we're one of the first groups to, to really test this, this new drug. And now we're testing a number of different drugs that are, uh, modulate the immune system to allow the hit, to wake up the stem cells. Um, 
Um, we're moving into testing male pattern baldness drugs. Um, and so uh, we don't have any trials right now, but uh, um, in a, probably early next year we'll have um, that group set up and, and going. Um, and so those are the two, the two major ones that we're doing trials on. So um, if you look at our website, um, which is up there, uh, or contact me, um, we can, you know, there's a bunch of, um, the trials are listed on our um, department website. So I hope you'll um, check it out or come or just visit the, our, our clinic. Great, yeah, I can hang around, so thank thanks very much. much.